I want to be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. You're listening to the Producer's Perspective Podcast with your host, Tony Award winner, Ken Davenport. Hey everybody, Ken Davenport here, eager to get to this week's podcast featuring Paula Wagner, Hollywood super mogul, producer of movies like Mission Impossible. She's going to tell you about the differences and the similarities between producing big budget Hollywood blockbusters like Mission Impossible and producing big budget Broadway blockbusters as well. But before we get there, this week's podcast brought to you by our own board game, Be a Broadway Star. Just in time for the holidays, if you need a last minute gift for your theater lover, Get Be a Broadway Star. BeABroadwayStar.com, one of the top selling Broadway gifts on Amazon.com. You cannot go wrong with this game. It's like life and charades had a baby, and that baby was a board game. Uh, you can win a Tony, you can get cut from auditions, you'll have a blast. Go to BeABroadwayStar.com, pick one up for the theater lover in your life. And now, on with the podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. I am Ken Davenport. You're listening to the Producer's Perspective Podcast, and you are in for a treat today. If this is your first time with us, you picked an episode to tune in. We have a superstar producer as our guest today, and a superstar producer on both coasts of this country, both sides of the entertainment industry. Please welcome to the podcast, Broadway and Hollywood producing superstar, Paula Wagner. Welcome, Paula. Well, thank you very much, Ken. What an introduction. Well, I'll I'll give you a little bit of uh, of Paula's bio here, and you'll see that she will live up to that more. She, uh, Paula, as a Hollywood producer, was behind a little bitty film called Mission Impossible and its sequels, as well as the others, Vanilla Sky, many more. At one point, she was the CEO of United Artist Pictures. Uh, As a Broadway producer, she produced The Heiress, Grace, and is currently represented by Pretty Woman on Broadway, which is doing mega business down there at the Nederlander Theater. We'll certainly talk about that. There are gobs and gobs more credits all online if you want to Google her, but we're not going to waste any time with that because I want to get to this conversation. So, Paula, what fascinates me about your career is your ability to work in both theater and film at its highest level. And we were just talking, I know a little bit about your career, you, you've actually bounced back and forth on both coasts, literally, and you started in the theater, right? I did. I started acting when I was 13 years old at the Youngstown Playhouse in Youngstown, Ohio. In fact, in Youngstown, I trained because I wanted to go to Carnegie Mellon University where I went and was an acting major in the drama department. I played Alexandra and Little Foxes. No, but I, I did a lot of, a lot of work there. I did a lot of summer stock in in Ohio, actually, and, uh, started acting, studied with the Sandy Meisner at the Neighborhood Playhouse and graduated from Carnegie Mellon and came to New York. And I did, one of the first things I did was the Broadway show. This will date me, but, uh, of Lenny, the Brooks Atkinson Theater. You just moved to New York and got a Broadway show. Well, it wasn't that that easy. (laughs) No, no. I started working for the designer, the stage designer. Then, you know, replaced an actor and I played like 20 different roles. But your in was with the designer first? That's how you got yourself in the building, if you yes. will? Yes. So when did you decide that acting wasn't what you wanted to spend your life doing? Well, I acted a lot, actually. I did television, film. I, I did a lot of things. I, at that time, the women's movement, interestingly enough, was affected me very much because there was something about taking charge of your own life. And at that point, I felt, and I had been a professional actress now for six Six or seven years, actually, out of out of college, I felt that as an actress, I didn't have enough control over my own life, over what I what I said, what I did. Someone else costumed me. I spoke somebody else's words. I moved where someone told me to move, and I wanted my independence. So I co-authored uh, and put together a play that was published by Samuel French that I did off Broadway called Out of Our Father's House, which was a feminist play. And I did it in 1975, 76, because I was involved at that time with the women's movement. And I am a published playwright there. But that so really... So still in Samuel French's catalog yes, to this day? Yes, Is it performed around the country, around uh, the world? All over now? the world. You get little royalty checks? Yes, $12 a year. I mean, amazing. <laughs> 
passive income. <laughs> yes, really, really <laughs> passive. So literally, I was doing Shakespeare at Yale one day, and I was a Hollywood agent the next. And there was a, there was a period of time of evolution between that leap from uh, classical theater to a small agency in Hollywood where I was representing actors and actresses, and and I liked it. I liked being that. I saw myself as an advocate. And again, this was in the late 70s, early 80s. And from that, I was recruited. I was the first, one of the first female agents at this little unknown company then that was called Creative Artists Agency. Never heard of it. (laughs) And so after being with an excellent small agency, I went to Creative Artists Agency. I was one of maybe four or five women agents there at the time, the beginning. I was there for almost 13 and a half years. So I have many questions, but I want to go a little back and just recap for all our listeners. So (laughs) you study acting, you move to New York, you're a design assistant, you somehow turn that into an acting role on Broadway. So Mm -hmm. you're a Broadway actress. You then write a play that is published by Samuel French, And then you decide, okay, I'm going to be an agent now. And you're recruited by what is now, of course, CAA. What do you think it was about you at this time? Or what did you have that was able to get you in all these doors and and be successful at this age of your life? That's an interesting question. You know, it it wasn't an active conscious decision. I had things I wanted to say. I had things I wanted to do. And I fell in love with the theater. I just did. That was where I thrived, where I felt, where I was excited. And a kid from Ohio with all those dreams, and certainly that's a theme in my current show, Pretty Woman, you know, everybody's got to have a dream. And um, I just loved it. And then it evolves. Things evolve and change. As I said, the women's movement influenced me. And... uh, just, you know, the practical realities of figuring it all out. Who am I? Asking the questions you ask yourself when you're in your 20s and 30s and ending up in Los Angeles. And a lot of it was being open and available to luck. You know, everybody says you have to be lucky. Luck is something that you open your eyes to discovering that, gee, that might be luck. It doesn't grab you and take you someplace. You kind of find it. I was offered a job as an agent, and it was never anything that was in my mind at all. I did not want to be an agent. Frankly, economics are a motivator, and I wanted something that I could be have more actual direct effect on what was happening, making decisions that had some business ramifications. So when you were an agent, what... How long were you an agent at CAA? So I was at CAA probably 13 and a half years. And what, as an agent, was the biggest skill you learned that you still use today as a producer? It's very rare that people go through the agenting world and then become producers. What skills and what training did you get there that you use today? Working with talent. I call it the advocacy for talent. <laughs> so somehow it's, it's finding a happy medium. It's fair for it, we're in a negotiation. Everybody everybody walks away happy. Everybody gives a little something and they get a little something. Good handshake. That's my way of negotiating. Are good, you tough? Good. Yes, I can be, but I'm fair. I really try to think in any negotiation what is fair to both to me and what is fair to the other person. As a producer now, do you get involved in the day-to-day negotiations of your major deals, or do you let a general manager or a lawyer do it all? First of all, I have fantastic general managers that I work with, 101 Productions, Wendy Orshan, Jeff Wilson, and their entire team. I've you know worked with wonderful lawyers. I, I get involved with pretty much everything. I do hire and bring on the very best people and respect the people that I work with and let them do what it is they do the best and learn from the people that I think, you know, know more than I do. I respect that. I want really smart, really talented, really capable people around me. That's how I learn and grow. 
but I do get involved with the with with decisions. I I love it, and I get involved with the details. Let's go back to the history a little bit because we stopped at CAA and, and you uh, took another very big step after CAA. How did you become a Hollywood producer after the agency? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, as an agent, you, in, in many respects, you do function a bit like a producer. I'm talking from a Hollywood perspective. You know, it's in Hollywood and, and making a film and making a Broadway play are very similar because everything starts with content and story. You have to have a great story. You have to have characters, right? And, and you know this because you do the same thing. And it's, we all look for that. What is that story that is worthy of being put on stage or put in film and finding the right thing? So that's the first thing. And then how do you put the, put it together? Well, that's what an agent does. An agent, of course, besides getting employment and advising their clients, an agent is putting things together. I would put my clients together. I was part of a process of putting movies together through my clients, be it actors, directors, writers. That's what you do with play. I've never the thought about thing. that way, actually, especially in Hollywood, this packaging, packaging yeah. idea, right, which is yeah. really producing. Yes, that is producing. Because if you think about it when you're putting a play together, if you have a straight play or a musical, you know, and, and Pretty Woman, once we had the idea, which was a movie, which, by the way, is a very valid art form, the idea of film to theater, you know, <laughs> wherever a good idea it comes from. And so you, when you get the good idea, and once I had the script, the book, you know, you bring in a director and you bring in your composers and, and then you bring in the, the creatives and the actors. And it's all such a creative process. It has to have a firm and carefully laid out business plan underlying it. And that's, of course, the business plans and the business of film is a little different than theater, but it's still, the results are still the same in many ways. Let's get back to this comment that you made earlier about that it all starts with the content. It doesn't matter if you're a stage producer or a Broadway producer or a movie producer, it's about the story. Are there certain stories that are better suited for film, or are there stories that are better suited for plays, or can any story be made into any form of entertainment? Well, the answer to you to those questions are yes, yes, and yes. Now, <laughs> what I mean by that, an interesting phenomenon is that film and live stage are getting closer and closer together more than ever because you are seeing events on stage that have a lot of filmic qualities to them. And on film, you're seeing more theatricality. You're seeing more musicals and, and more plays that are converting to film. But not all films work on stage and not all stage plays work on film. Stage really naturally goes deeper into the dialogue. The dialogue is all in, uh, because you don't have the art of the close-up. In, in film, the editor and the director can tell you what you are supposed to look at. On stage, you have to, as an actor, show where you have to look. As soon as the director completes his or her job, it's an actor's medium. So, so. what what made you say, Pretty Woman, this is a story that will work in both mediums? This is one that can be done very successful movie. I mean, a lot of people would have been like, I'm not touching that thing with a 10-foot pole, no matter how much it did at the box office, because it was so successful. And you said, no, 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 it it can be just as successful on Broadway. And it is doing that. It's doing mega bucks down there. So what was it about it that said to you, this will work on stage as well? Well, it, Pretty Woman obviously is one of the most beloved romantic comedies in the world. And it has, do you want to keep it? It has, it's New York. That's one of the things. New York is New we York. We keep rolling sirens. I out. love it. See, if I were doing the movie now, we would have said cut. Um, but it had 
it always had the structure of the story was really a classical structure if you look at it. It was a, a, a kind of romance, this romance between these two unlikely characters, and a romance of redemption and transformation. And it had a very defined storyline, very defined characters, and the characters all changed. It had a musicality to it. And Gary Marshall always, he always felt from the time the film came out that it was a musical. And, you know, getting involved with this six years ago, because it's a long process, but it's a long process making a film. Right before this, I did a film, a small film, but a film that means a lot to me, and I think to a lot of people, called Marshall, starring Chadwick Boseman. It was about a trial and a case in, in the young Thurgood Marshall's career. That took five and a half years to develop and get off the ground. This took, Pretty Woman took six years. But it had, it had the elements of a musical. It had a classical nature. The young woman who's doing something she doesn't want to be doing, the, the man who is lost both on, on all fronts. He's lost in Hollywood he's and he's, he's lost, you know, and his whole life has been about making money. And it's kind of a rags to riches, timeless romantic story. I'm I'm kind of a sucker for that. I love those kind of stories, as did people all over the world. So making that decision seemed logical. It seemed like the right thing to do at the right time. You touched a bit on the business models being different. What's one thing about the Hollywood business model that you wish the theater business model had and vice versa? Well, it's interesting. I think that the theater business model, because of the nature of the investors, truly is more transparent. And the Hollywood model is does not have the same kind of transparency. I think Hollywood accounting procedures are antiquated. I think there are certain aspects of the system that could become more modern and could really move with the kind of alacrity and the speed that technology is moving what happens on screen or the the creativity that's happening now. All of those things could lead the business world of Hollywood a little more. I think the studio systems are revamping. And what's, what's interesting about Broadway is Broadway doesn't have a studio system. And the the studios developed in the 30s, originally in the movie business, it was all kind of a free-for-all. They were mostly run by women. (laughs) There were a lot of women directing all the silent films, etc. And this kind of wave of Eastern European men came in and started these studio systems and contract players, et cetera, and created a system that's still in effect today. And I think if you look at Broadway, there are two two aspects. There's the producer and the theater owner, right? There's no really in-between. You have the producer and the exhibitor, if you will. In film, you have the producer, you have the, the distributor, which is the studio, the middle people, as it were, and then you have the exhibitors. There's a lot of layers and levels, and a Broadway producer takes on much of the responsibility, traditionally, of the studio, as does the theater owner take on not only the responsibilities of the exhibitors, you see that in film, but but also of the studio. And what do you think that we do here in theater well that Hollywood could learn from? Well, I think the organization, the details. At least I have worked with the best. I include you in this, Ken. Oh, (laughs) I've worked with really extraordinarily talented people. And I think you're really entrepreneurial. The people are much more, you have to be entrepreneurial because you're creating something out of nothing, really. We're not companies or corporations. No. We're just a bunch of mavericks no. just running around trying to pay exactly. our bills. Exactly. Exactly. And what about, is there anything that you wish here in the theater 
we would do a little bit more like Hollywood. And I don't know that I've been deep in the weeds enough to say exactly what that is, because I really, I love that moment. I walk in that theater and I listen to the audience. I love the, the fact that you sit there in the darkened space and you realize what you're going to see on stage, no one will ever see that same performance again. They may have the same lines and movement, never the same performance. I'll tell you what I think could work in, in Hollywood. Dynamic pricing. Think about this. A movie costs $200 million and, or 150 or $10 million or $5 million. Those are the range. The Marvel movies have these very substantial budgets. And then there are the independent films that could be made for $2, 3000000 million. And yet, you go into the movie theater, and it, the price is basically the same. And in the theater, you can shift and change. You have the prime seating. You have different times that you can go to the theater, different performances. That is a fascinating idea. So I've, I actually have never heard anyone suggest dynamic pricing for movies, but of course, it only makes sense. A big Marvel movie comes out. You want to be the first person to see it on that first weekend at Friday at 8 o'clock. It's a $200 million movie. Sure. I'm sure there are a ton of people that would pay $25, $35 to be one of the first, as opposed to the people that are going to see it three or four weeks later on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. I think so. But yet, and then on the other hand, we can say, isn't that wonderful? Because everybody has the same opportunity to see it, to see the same movie. So there's something very democratic about that. I I love the idea, though, of the theater becoming in affordable to get more people into the theater and realize what an exciting place to be it is to see there and watch this thing unfold. I want to lead the witness a little bit here with a, with, and talk about Mission Impossible for a second. Was that tested in front of audiences before it went to its final print? Did you show it to audiences, focus groups, or that kind of thing? Or is that kind of research on most of the movies you do? Absolutely. Every movie I've ever done has focus groups and research and a lot of things and scenes that you will see in any movie has been reshot, re-edited, characters have been added, characters have been taken away, cuts. That is the movie process. And that is something, and that's a good question. My involvement was was really with the original Mission 1, 2, and 3, working with, obviously, Tom Cruise and the template that became the Mission Impossible series. But every movie, I think that's something that theater could benefit from, is doing uh, testing your previews, doing some market research. What did the audience like about this moment? Or what didn't work for that moment? The preview process is extensive. The getting of the audiences that come in, the, the focus groups, the verbal focus groups, the written analysis. It's a very, very carefully structured observation that helps then take the movie to the final place. And I think that that's a very, it's a very helpful tool with, with theater also. Yeah, I'm a big believer in research, obviously, which is why I asked that question, because I, I think we should be doing more of it. Use, use Pretty Woman as an example. You go through previews here. How much did it change from first preview to opening night? Pretty Woman really changed a lot from, well, from the first show we did in Chicago to our opening night. We made, we did make changes here in New York. And well, I will say this about Jerry Mitchell, who's just a great talent. You know how he is. He's just fantastic. He does not stop working until the minute we open. And even then, it keeps on. It goes on and on. He's uh, he's amazing. He listens to the audience. He's responsive as a director. And er everybody really was incredibly responsive that way. We made a lot of changes. And the show, it tightens. It becomes its own entity. A couple of months after it's running, it suddenly has this other life. Yeah, it's know? fascinating. A photographer once said to me, you know, Ken, I can't stand that you asked me to come in and shoot your show like two weeks into previews. What I really want to do is shoot the show three months into previews when the actors have really found the show and their motions and their faces are totally different. I thought that was a very... very you make a show, a show has so many lives to it. 
that it exists. And to see it three months in, to see it six months in, to see it opening night, it changes. And that's one of the great things about acting on stage. The actor has the chance to actually perform from start to finish, to really find the character and every night play it over and over again. When you're doing a film, an actor has to simultaneously keep in their mind the entire trajectory of the performance because they will be playing things out of context. Listen, I've shot movies like this where you shoot the last scene at the beginning. That's not a good idea because traditionally you'll go back and reshoot it because you're not really there, you know, when you've gone through the whole film. So what's great about the theater is for the actors. Okay, my last question, which is my genie question. I want you to imagine that the genie from Aladdin comes to visit you and grants you one wish. What's the one thing about working on Broadway that drives you nuts? Like you just said, you'd be taking care of people. You're such a good-hearted person, even though you were an agent at one point. We'll forgive that part of you. <laughs> uh, you're such a good person. What's the one thing that drives you batty, that makes you so angry and frustrated that you'd ask the genie to wish away from Broadway as a whole just like that? Well, I don't know that it's Broadway. And by the way, I really like the genie in Aladdin. <laughs> I'd like him to come visit me and give me a couple of wishes. That'd be great. I think that the word I always is respect, people respecting each other, one another. And I think that so many of the issues that we're looking at today, the word respect comes to my mind, being respectful and kindness. And I don't mean to sound like a Pollyanna. I'm not. And I was an agent. And I am a producer. And <laughs> I've somehow made my way through the... the uh, the maze of the world of entertainment. But kindness once in a while, I think, is important. What a great way to end it. Well, thank you for that. It's a wonderful wish for not only our business, but for the entire world. Thank you so much to Paula Wagner for joining us today, and thanks to all of you for listening. We will see you on the Producer's Perspective podcast next time. Look out, bro.